Hello, hello, Doofer911 here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the forward panels and displays in the PMDG Boeing 777. So before we get into the details, I'm going to start by saying that I will be using a lot of jargon, and as I said in my previous video, this plane is not really suitable for complete beginners to aviation, because it's so fantastically detailed and realistic. Therefore, if you are new to flight simulation, or even if you're experienced and don't understand some of the terms that I use, I would highly encourage you to check out my tutorials playlist. Each video in that playlist was carefully designed for complete beginners to aviation, taking you through the basics up to being able to understand how to fly something like this aircraft. So with that out of the way, let's crack on with learning about the different areas of the flight deck in front of the pilots. Up at the top we have this long thin area called the glare shield which protrudes forward towards the pilots. These areas directly in front of the pilots are the left and right forward panels. Between those is the centre forward panel. We will also briefly take a look at the left and right side panels which sit to the side of each pilot. On the forward panels you will see six display screens which give pilots plenty of information about the flight and the aircraft's state and condition. On the far left and right are the left and right outboard displays. Next to those are the left and right inboard displays. In the middle we have the upper centre and lower centre displays. Now, in the 777, pilots have a lot of control over the information that is shown on each of these screens, which is something that we'll take a look at later. However, under normal circumstances, the outboard screens are used to show the primary flight display. This contains all of the critical information needed to fly the plane, such as its speed, attitude and altitude, amongst other things. The inboard screens are typically used for the navigation display, which gives pilots information about their routes and waypoints, and also shows any areas of poor weather in front of the plane. The upper middle display normally shows the ECAS or ICAS, which stands for the Engine Indicating and Crew Alerting System. This provides pilots with key information about the engines, the flaps position, the landing gear position, along with a summary of the aircraft pressurisation and fuel amounts. This display will also show any alerts or warning messages to pilots if a problem occurs. Finally, the lower centre screen is used as a multifunction display. Pilots often change what is shown on this display so they can look at the various aircraft systems in depth. Another common use of this display is for pilots to use the electronic checklist to cross-check their actions and procedures for each stage of a flight. Either side of the lower centre display are the CDUs, or Computer Display Units. These allow pilots to interact with the flight computers where they can enter data relating to the aircraft's route and its performance. So let's begin by looking at some of these panels in detail. Now I'm going to start with the displays first and then we'll look at the glare shield panel afterwards. So let's begin with the primary flight display. Now I'm going to rattle through the details here quickly, so if there's any terminology that you don't understand, I'd highly recommend that you check out my video on glass cockpit displays here, which explains all of the elements of this type of display in more detail. Starting on the left we have the airspeed tape, and within the black box is the current indicated airspeed. Above the speed tape is the commanded speed in pink, which can either be set by the autopilot or the flight crew. This is a target speed, and if the auto throttle system is enabled and an automatic speed mode has been selected, it will automatically adjust the thrust settings on both engines to match the commanded speed. There will also be a little pink pointer on the speed tape to represent the commanded speed. At the bottom of the speed tape is an alternative speed measurement. 
When the aircraft is in the cruise phase of flight, this is shown as a Mach number. When the aircraft is below a certain speed and altitude, the aircraft's ground speed will be shown here instead. In the middle we have the attitude indicator. The pink lines represent the flight director bars. If a particular heading or altitude has been selected, the flight director bars will move, indicating what attitude the aircraft needs to meet the selected heading or altitude. On the right we have the altitude tape with the current altitude in the black box, measured in feet. Like the speed, the pink number at the top of the tape is the commanded altitude, which is typically selected by the pilots, and similar to the speed tape, there will be a pink bracket which gives a visual representation of the commanded altitude on the tape. To the right of that is a vertical speed indicator. When climbing or descending, there is a white number on top of the indicator that gives a numerical readout of the vertical speed. Along the top is the Flight Mode Annunciator panel. This consists of three columns which indicate which modes the autothrottle and autopilot systems are working in. The first column shows the autothrottle mode which controls the aircraft's speed. The second column shows the autopilot roll mode which is responsible for which direction the plane is facing. The third column shows the autopilot pitch mode, which controls the altitude of the plane and how it climbs or descends to different heights. Just under that, on the right hand side, is the angle of attack indicator, showing the angle which the plane is flying relative to the incoming airflow. The large green text above the attitude indicator is the flight director and autopilot status indicator. This simply shows if either the flight director and autopilot systems are active. The small white text to the left of that is the navigation source reference. This relates to different scales which will show up at the bottom and right hand side of the attitude indicator during different phases of flight. These scales typically display the lateral and vertical deviation from a planned flight path. Normally you will see an LNAV and VNAV scale, but you also often see ILS localizer and glide slope scales during an approach to a runway. Moving towards the bottom of the primary flight display, the first thing to note here is the green text underneath the altitude tape. This represents the current barometric pressure that's been selected. This can be changed using the EFIS panel which we'll take a look at shortly. Finally, at the bottom, there is a top of a compass rose which tells the pilots which direction the plane is heading. Similar to the speed and altitude, the pink number represents the commanded direction which can be selected by the flight crew. The green text represents whether the plane is flying in reference to magnetic north or true north. So that's the primary flight display. Moving to the right, we have the captain's inboard display, which typically shows the navigation display. So during this clip, the plane is flying along during its cruise phase of flight, which is what you'll spend most of your time doing in this aircraft. So the navigation display normally shows the aircraft's planned flight path from an overhead perspective. This little triangle at the bottom represents the aircraft, and the pink line represents its planned flight path. Each star along the flight path is one of the planned waypoints for the route, and next to each star is its name or identifier. The pink star represents the next waypoint that the aircraft is flying to. Now if you look closely underneath the aircraft triangle, you will see 0, 0.0. .0. This number represents how far the aircraft is away from the planned flight path. For example, if you saw 0.2R underneath, that would indicate that the plane is 0.2 nautical miles to the right of its planned flight path. 
The curved line at the top of the flight path is a compass rose to show which direction the aircraft is flying, and that is confirmed by the numerical representation at the top of the display. You will also see a white line extending from the aircraft triangle to the compass rose. This represents the aircraft's track, or direction over the ground. This may be different to the aircraft's heading, which is represented by a small triangle on the outside of the compass rose, pointing down. Along this white line, you will see a couple of hatch marks, one of which has a number beside it. This represents the range, or distance, and I'll demonstrate how this works a little later in the video. Moving up to the top left corner, first we have a readout of the aircraft's ground speed and true airspeed in knots. Just underneath that we have a readout indicating the current wind direction and speed outside of the aircraft. This gives pilots an idea of whether they're flying in a headwind, a crosswind or a tailwind. Over in the top right corner, we have details about the next waypoint which the aircraft is flying to. First is its name. The second line represents what time the plane will arrive at the waypoint, represented in Zulu time. The third line tells pilots the distance to the waypoint, measured in nautical miles. At the bottom, you will find some green text. The RNP value represents the required navigation performance. This value determines how accurate the navigation systems on board need to be to accurately plot the aircraft's position over the ground, and by extension, plot the aircraft's position in relation to the planned flight path. The ANP value represents the actual navigation performance or how accurately the plane is currently calculating its position. As long as the actual performance number is less than the required performance, then the plane is plotting its position accurately. If the actual performance becomes greater than the required performance, then that could indicate a problem with the navigation systems. Just to the right of that, we have the letters GPS, indicating that the plane is using GPS data as its primary source of navigation and position calculation. Now, there is a lot more that can be shown on this display, however it will be better to show this later on in the video when we look at some of the other panels, which are used to control what is shown on this display. And finally, let's look at this central display panel. This is called the ECAS or ICAS display. This is the engine indicating and crew alerting system. As the name suggests, this display is primarily used to show engine information and also any alerts or warning messages. That said, it does also give information about the landing gear position, the flaps position, along with a summary of aircraft pressurization and fuel levels. It can also show air traffic control messages, however I don't believe that this is implemented in the simulator. So as you can see, the ECAS is divided into these areas, but let's take a look at the details. The top left quarter is dedicated to engine information. At the top is the aircraft's total air temperature reading. Beside that is the thrust reference mode. This takes information from the flight management computers and determines a maximum speed for the engines to operate at for a given phase of flight. Below that you have the primary engine indications for the left and right engines. The first two indicators are the engine N1 speeds, which correspond to the engine speed as a percentage. In this example, the engines are running at their idle speed of roughly 21%. If I move the throttles up here slightly, you will see an indicator on the outside which represents the throttle's lever position. The engine will then speed up or slow down to match the throttle lever position. The green numbers above each indicator represent the maximum speed which the engine can run at, as determined by the flight management computers and the thrust reference mode above. 
Please note that these engine speeds are respected by the auto throttle system. However, if pilots take manual control of the throttle, they have the maximum performance of the engine available. For example, if the pilots move the thrust levers fully forward, the engines will operate at 100% of their capability and ignore any computer calculated limits. Below the N1 readouts are the exhaust gas temperature readouts. These simply show the temperature of the exhaust in degrees Celsius. If an engine begins to run too hot, the first symptom you will notice is an increased exhaust temperature, which is why this specific measurement is used. Moving over to the right side of the display, this area will show any warnings, cautions or advisory messages to the pilots. Warnings are shown in red text and generally indicate a serious issue which requires immediate attention. Cautions are shown in amber text and this requires investigation and action from the pilots. Finally, advisory messages are shown in white and these give pilots basic but important information. Underneath those messages is an indicator for the landing gear. When the landing gear is down and locked, there will be a green box with the word down in the middle. When the gear is up, this portion of the display will be blank. Underneath that is an indicator for the flaps position. When the flaps are up, this area of the display is blank. However, when a flaps position is selected, a hollow bar will be displayed and the flaps lever position will be shown with a pink indicator. The bar will begin to fill with white based on the actual position of the flaps as they travel to the selected setting. Once in the correct position, the indicator will be shown with green text and a green mark. Below that is a quick summary of the total fuel level within the aircraft and the current fuel temperature. Just to the left of that is a summary of the pressurization system. This shows the bleed air duct pressure, the cabin altitude and the rate of the cabin's climb or descent. Below that is the delta pressure. This is the difference in pressure between the inside and the outside of the plane. If this grows too high, it could lead to increased stress and tension on the aircraft's structure. To the right of that are two indicators for the outflow valves, and finally in the bottom left corner is the selected landing altitude. So that about covers the details for the displays. Now of course, there is one more display which is the lower centre display, However, it will be easier to explain and demonstrate what is shown as we look at some of the other forward panels in more detail. So, we're going to come back up to the glare shield and the first panel that we're going to look at is the EFIS control panel. EFIS stands for Electronic Flight Instrument System and this is used to change what information is available on both the primary flight display and also the navigation display. The captain and first officer both have an EFIS panel, so they can change their displays independently from each other. So the first selector is the minimums selector, which allows pilots to set their minimum decision altitude or decision height. The outer control allows pilots to switch between using the radio altimeter, which measures the aircraft's height above ground, or the barometric reference, which measures the altitude against mean sea level. The smaller control allows pilots to set the altitude as needed. You can right click to increase the value and left click to decrease it. In this aircraft, there is this little control mechanic where if you click and hold your mouse button and then drag your mouse in the same direction, you can get the value to increase or decrease in value faster. However, this is a little fiddly and it is a little tricky to use. You'll notice that as I change the altitude, the minimum setting is shown on the primary flight display just underneath the attitude indicator. There is also a green marker which shows up on the altitude tape 
to provide additional confirmation of the minimums setting. There is also a reset button which is used to clear the minimums from the primary flight display, however it doesn't actually reset the minimums value to its default. This small button is the flight path vector, which will draw a little vector indicator on the primary flight display. This indicates the plane's actual direction through the air. Next to that is a meters button, which will enable a readout for the aircraft's current and selected altitude measured in meters. The control in the top right of the panel is the barometric reference selector. The outer control allows a pilot to switch between measuring barometric pressure in inches of mercury or hectopascals. You'll notice as I switch between the two, the barometric pressure is changed on the primary flight display underneath the altitude tape. The smaller control allows you to enter the required value for the air pressure. There is also a button which allows you to instantly switch between standard pressure and a local pressure setting. Next, we move down and the first control we have is a nav aid selector on both the left and right side of the panel. This allows pilots to display information about the left and right VOR and ADF systems on the navigation display. When selected, you'll see information about the selected VOR or ADF is shown in the bottom left and bottom right corners of the display. The next control is a nav display mode selector, which allows pilots to change what mode the display is working in. By default, map mode is used. APP represents the approach mode, which will show localizer and glide slope information, along with ILS details on the display. VOR mode will show VOR navigation information and details of the VOR station currently being used to navigate. And finally, plan mode, which displays a non-moving depiction of the route with north at the top of the display. This can be used to examine the route which has been programmed into the flight computers. In the middle of this control, we have the center button. When pressed, this places the aircraft into the middle of the navigation display and provides a 360 degree view around the aircraft. Beside that is simply a range selector, which allows pilots to increase or decrease the range or distance shown on the navigation display. Now remember earlier there was this white line with the hatch marks. Well, each of these represent a quarter of the selected range. The hatch mark in the middle is the halfway point, and the distance is shown next to that mark. In the middle of the control is also a traffic button, which is used to display information from the traffic collision avoidance system on the navigation display. This will show the position of any nearby aircraft on the navigation display. Finally, underneath those controls are some map switches, which will show additional information on the navigation display. First, we have the weather radar switch, which will display any areas of heavy precipitation and poor weather on the navigation display. Next is the station switch, which will show a variety of navigation aids and their position on the map. The third button is the waypoint button, which will show waypoints and their location. Next is the airport button, which will show the closest airports and their location. The data button will show the estimated time of arrival and estimated altitude at each waypoint along a flight plan. The position button will show extra details about the aircraft's position and also radials from the selected VOR station. The final button is the terrain button, which will show terrain returns from the aircraft's radar system. One final thing to be aware of when you're using the navigation display, if you have a large range selected on the display, 
Some information far away from the aircraft may not be shown when you select these informational buttons. You will receive an alert indicating that some data is missing if this occurs. Moving along the glare shield, the next panel we have is the mode control panel, and this allows pilots to interact with the auto throttle and autopilot systems. Now, I could make an entire video about the autopilot logic and how the different modes work, so for this video, I'll just give a brief description of each control. The panel is laid out similar to the annunciator that we saw on the primary flight display. We have a group of controls on the left relating to the auto throttle and speed control. In the middle we have roll modes for directional control and on the right are pitch modes for height, climbing and descending control. Now there are some additional controls on the far left and the far right as well. First up on both sides we have the autopilot engage button. This is the main on switch for the autopilot controls. Just so you know, when a button is active, a green light shows up on the button. Below both switches is a flight director on off switch. The flight director looks at what the intended flight path is and calculates what roll and pitch angles are required to achieve that flight path. It will then send those signals to the primary flight computers, which translate those instructions into actual movements of the flight control surfaces. The flight director can also be used in manual flight to give pilots guidance as well. Near the middle of the panel, there is an autopilot disengage bar, which can be pushed down. As the name suggests, this disengages the autopilot systems and prevents them from being activated. The bar can be returned to the up position and this allows the autopilot systems to be re-engaged again. Anytime the autopilot is disabled in flight, a warning will be given and alarm will be heard. Starting on the left, first we have two auto throttle arm switches for the left and right engine. When they are in the up or armed position, the auto throttle system is prepared and ready to take control of the engines. Below that is the climb or continuous thrust switch. This sets the engine to the thrust limit which has been calculated by the flight management computer. Under that is the auto throttle switch. When it's active, this automatically selects the most appropriate thrust mode based on the selected pitch mode. Moving across, the first item that we have here is the speed window. Now, at times, this little display might be blank when the auto flight systems are active. When it's blank, the speed window is said to be closed. When the speed is shown, the window is open. The control under the window allows pilots to select a specific speed. You can control it by placing your cursor over the control knob and rolling your mouse wheel. You can rotate clockwise to increase the value and rotate anti-clockwise to decrease the value. This control can also be pressed by left clicking which under certain conditions will either open or close the speed window. This small button above the window allows pilots to change the speed between an indicated airspeed, IAS, or part of a Mach speed. On the right, the first button is the LNAV, or Lateral Navigation Switch. This activates the LNAV roll mode. To keep it simple, LNAV is used to follow a route which has been programmed into the flight computers. Below that is the VNAV or Vertical Navigation Switch. This uses information about a pre-programmed route to control what height the plane should be at for a given point along the flight route. The last switch is the Flight Level Change Switch. When enabled, the aircraft will climb or descend to the selected flight level at the speed which has been selected in the speed window. 
the pitch angle of the aircraft will automatically change based on the chosen airspeed. Moving to the middle, we have a heading or track window which shows a selected direction for the aircraft to be facing. The small button above the window allows pilots to choose between a heading, which is the direction that the plane is facing, or a track, which is the actual direction the plane takes over the ground based on wind conditions. The heading selector works similar to the speed. It can be rotated to change the selected heading. Around the outside of the selector is the bank angle limit selector. This can be used to select a maximum bank angle for the aircraft. There is also a heading select button, which enables the heading select or track select mode. When these modes are active, the plane will turn to the heading shown in the heading window. Now, if you change the selected heading, the plane will automatically turn to that new heading. Underneath that is a heading hold button. When it's enabled, the aircraft will roll the wings to a level position and fly straight on the heading that the plane was facing when the button was pressed. The next window is the vertical speed or the flight path angle window. This allows you to set a rate or an angle of vertical speed as the primary factor in changing the aircraft's height. Like before, there is a button which allows you to switch between the vertical speed or the flight path angle. The control below the window is a scroll wheel, similar to the one that you have on your mouse, which allows you to increase or decrease the value in the window. The button linked to the control is the vertical speed or flight path angle switch, which enables and activates the respective mode. The last window, as you can probably guess, is the altitude window, which shows the selected altitude. As before, the knob here allows you to increase or decrease the value. The outer control here allows you to select it between an automatic or 1000 foot increments. Automatic allows you to select hundreds of feet if finer altitude control is needed. The altitude selector can also be pushed in with a left click. This is normally done to initiate an altitude change to a newly selected altitude. The switch underneath that is the altitude hold switch, which enables the altitude hold mode. When this switch is enabled, the aircraft will level off and hold the altitude that the aircraft was at when the switch was pressed. The last couple of switches can be used when performing an ILS approach to a runway. The first button is the localizer switch, which will arm or enable the localizer roll mode. This allows an aircraft to follow a localizer radio signal from an ILS system. The last switch is the approach switch. This will arm the localizer roll mode but also arm the glide slope pitch mode. This allows the aircraft to track both a localizer and a glide slope radio signal to perform an ILS approach down to a runway. The last panel here on the glare shield is the display select panel. Pilots can use this panel to change what information is shown on particular displays. Now what you can see at the moment in the middle of the screen is a pop-out of the lower centre display, which I can use to demonstrate this panel in action. First, I'm going to highlight these switches here, which are called the display switches. Each switch shows a different page of information. The first page is the engine page, and this shows more details and measurements from the left and right engines. Next is the status page, which shows information about the hydraulic system, the APU, the oxygen system, and also shows some informational messages at times. At the bottom are three more important switches. The first one is the checklist page. This allows pilots to interact with the electronic checklist. You'll also notice these grey tabs at the top and this pink crosshair icon. 
Both pilots have a little touchpad on the central console which they can use to move the crosshair like a mouse cursor. Now if you move your mouse cursor over the display, you can also move the crosshair. If you click on the grey tabs, you can view different pages and menus within the checklist. The next button brings up the communications page, which allows pilots to interact with the communication system on board, such as the ACARS. This is like a text message service that is used within aviation, so pilots can send messages to their airline or to air traffic control. Now unfortunately, by default, you can't really use anything within these pages, However, it might be possible to do so with third-party add-ons which make use of this feature. Unfortunately, it's not something I've really looked into in any depth. The final page is the navigation page, which brings up a copy of a navigation display. In the middle, we have a selection of seven or eight buttons, which are the synoptic displays. These pages give an overview of various systems within the plane. To go through them quickly, we have the electric system, the hydraulic system, the fuel system, the air conditioning and pressurization system, the doors and their status, the landing gear, and also the flight control surfaces. There may also be an 8th button on some aircraft, depending on how they're configured, which gives you a camera view. Some 777 aircraft are fitted with three cameras which look at each of the landing gear to give pilots assistance in manoeuvring the aircraft on the ground. The three buttons at the top of the display are the multifunction display selector switches. These allow pilots to choose which display they want to change. The left inboard display, the lower center, or the right inboard display. The light shows which display is currently selected. For example, I can go over to the left display and select the engine page. I can go to the lower center display and then select the electric page. And then on the right display, let's say the fuel system. The final button on this panel is the Cancel and Recall button. This allows pilots to cancel any alerts which show up on the ECAS display. They can also recall any alerts which have been cancelled and get them to show on the screen again. It's quite common for aircraft to show alerts on the ground after the engines have been switched off because the engines provide power to many different systems on board. So, when the engines are switched off, a lot of these systems are affected to an extent. Before we finish up with the glare shield, there are a couple more controls to be aware of, which are not in the central area of the panel. Firstly, on both sides, we have the Master Warning and Caution Reset switch. When a warning or a caution occurs, an audible alarm will sound, and this switch will light up. Pilots can press this switch to extinguish the warning light and silence any alarms. Underneath that we have three buttons which are connected to the aircraft's data link system. Pilots can use these switches to respond to a message with an accept or reject message. They can also press cancel which will remove the message. Now again, because the data link and communication system doesn't appear to be modelled by default, these buttons don't serve much purpose at the moment, but they might be useful in the future. I do know that PMDG are working on their global flight operations product, which may make use of this feature. Finally, if we move to the outside of the glare shield, both pilots have three small controls. First is a microphone button, which in real life is a push to talk button, so pilots can speak to air traffic control. In the simulator, however, it is a shortcut to open up a 2D communications panel, which allows you to change radio frequencies, configure the radios and the transponder along with a weather radar panel. The middle control is a map light switch, which illuminates a small area to the side of the pilot seat. 
And finally is a clock button, which acts like a stopwatch button. Press once to start the stopwatch, press again to stop it, and press a third time to reset the stopwatch. So with that, that's every control on the glare shield covered. So now let's take a look at all of the controls on the forward panels. What we'll do is start on the far left beside the captain's seat and sweep around to the front of the flight deck. So the first thing we can take a look at is the oxygen mask. Now we can't do much with it in the sim, however we can use the test buttons to simulate checks of the oxygen mask and oxygen flow. Moving forward we have two light controls, one for the chart panel which is this small clipboard area above and the other is for the work table which is a small foldable table down below which you can't use in the sim. This small item here is simply a ventilation duct. Underneath that though we have the nose wheel steering tiller. This allows pilots to move the nose wheel through its full turning range of motion when the aircraft is on the ground and turning at a low speed. Rotate clockwise to turn right, anti-clockwise to turn left. Beside that is another clipboard area where pilots can store charts and other important paperwork. Nowadays it's likely that pilots will have some sort of tablet device where they can have an electronic flight bag which contains digital versions of charts and aircraft performance calculators. Moving forward to the next panel we have a handful of controls. First we have heater controls for shoulder and foot heaters. Below that we have brightness controls for the outboard and inboard displays. The final control is a light control for the forward panels. The outer knob controls the integrated lights which controls the brightness of the text on the panel. The smaller knob controls the flood lights which illuminates the whole forward panel area with an external light. Moving into the forward panel, the first controls we have are three switches. The top one is the navigation source switch. The second one is the display control source switch. The third switch is the air data and attitude data source switch. Now all three of these switches allow pilots to select alternative sources of information for each system in the event that a problem occurs with a primary system. Beside that is a chronograph, a clock giving pilots time information and stopwatch functionality. This can be controlled with the little clock button above on the glare shield. The outboard and inboard displays we already know, but hiding underneath them are a couple of items. First is the brake accumulator pressure indicator. This shows how much pressure is in the braking system, which is very important. If you've got no pressure, you've got no brakes. The gauge has a little warning light just above it as well. Moving across, there is a little plaque with the aircraft's registration on it. Alternatively, you may see the aircraft's cell cal code, or selective calling code. This allows air traffic control to send a radio signal to an aircraft which is flying in a remote area. The pilots will hear a tone over the radio, prompting them to respond to air traffic control. Next to that is an inboard display selector. This allows pilots to choose which screen they want to display on the inboard display. This is typically only used if there's been a failure within the display system. And finally beside that is the heading reference switch. Under normal circumstances, aircraft navigate in relation to magnetic north. However, pilots can force the plane to navigate in relation to true north with this switch. Now to the right of the inboard display, you will find the standby instruments. In this example, there is a single electronic standby instrument, which is essentially a miniature version of the primary flight display. Some aircraft operators may have three analog instruments instead, which is why there are three spaces to install these instruments. Moving over to the right side of the cockpit briefly, everything is pretty much the same except for this little selector switch here. 
This is the FMC selector and it can be used to select the left or right flight management computer to give guidance commands to the control systems. Auto tells the system to automatically switch between the two if one were to fail. Moving now to the centre of the forward panels, first up we have the ground proximity panel. All of these switches allow pilots to disable specific audio warnings, which will sound if the aircraft is too close to the ground and not configured correctly for landing. The first switch is the ground proximity glide slope inhibit switch. This disables the glide slope callout, which you may hear if you deviate from the glide slope during a final approach to a runway. The next switch is the ground proximity flap override switch. This inhibits the too low flaps callout. The next switch is the ground proximity gear override switch. This inhibits the too low gear callout. The last switch is the ground proximity terrain override switch, and this inhibits the obstacle and terrain alerts. Next is one of the simplest controls in the flight deck, it's the landing gear lever. Up makes the wheels go up, down makes the wheels go down. The little button beside that is the lever lock override button. Under certain conditions, there is a lock behind the panel which holds the lever in place to prevent accidental movement. This button allows crews to disable that lock and move the lever. The guarded switch on the right is the alternative gear switch. This allows pilots to lower the landing gear using the alternative gear extension system. Finally, at the bottom, we have the auto brake selector, which will allow you to select which mode you want the auto brake system to work in. RTO is the rejected takeoff mode. Off turns the system off. Surprise, surprise. Disarm will disengage the auto brake system and release brake pressure. Then finally, you have five settings for the auto braking system. Now, there's an important distinction here is that each setting represents a rate of deceleration with number one being the lowest, giving more gentle braking, max auto being the highest, meaning a fast deceleration and aggressive braking. Now one last thing I'll point out on this panel is the flap limit placard, which indicates the maximum speed that each stage of flaps can be extended. Okay, we're almost there, only a few more bits to point out. Underneath the lower centre display, we have the centre display control source switch. This allows pilots to select an alternative display source for the upper and lower centre displays. Below that is the ECAS event record switch. If pilots notice anything on the ECAS which looks unusual, they can press this button to record an event into the aircraft's computer memory. Then, after a flight, they can ask a maintenance team to assess the memory and assess the event. And finally, we have the upper and lower display brightness control switches. For the lower display, the smaller knob adjusts the overall brightness of the display, whereas the outer rotating control adjusts the brightness of only the weather radar and terrain radar returns when those are visible on the lower centre display. And that brings us to the end of this overview of the forward panels. Now, I know there's been a huge amount in this video, so if you've stuck with me until the end, thank you so, so much for watching this all of the way through. I honestly admire that you're taking the time to learn this aircraft in this level of detail, and it will help you appreciate everything that it's capable of. Moving forward, in the next video we're going to be moving along the centre pedestal where we will take a look at the control stand which contains the thrust levers along with some other controls and we'll also move towards the centre aisle stand which mainly contains radio and audio controls. So until the next time, thank you all very much for watching, take care out there and I will catch you all later.